The following is a presentation of the Redskins Broadcast Network. Welcome to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Larry Michael at Redskins Park. Each week, Redskins Chronicles takes an in-depth look at a piece of this team's storied legacy. And today, one of the all-time greats sits down with us, the dancing bear, Ron McDole. Before we hear from Ron, coming up this week, Sunday night, the Redskins in Dallas. Skins 1-3 and three coming off a bye. The Cowboys 2-3 and three coming off a tough loss to the Denver Broncos. We'll take a closer look at this game coming up on Sunday, but up first... A look at this storied rivalry between the Redskins and Cowboys. It's brought to you by Emerita. Great rivalries have many origins, but the rivalry between the Redskins and Cowboys, perhaps the greatest in football, began over a song. 1960, Texas oil tycoon Clint Murchison Jr. needed approval from each NFL owner before he could realize his dream of a Dallas-based expansion team. Only one refused, Redskins owner George Preston Marshall. There's no excuse for expansion in the National Football League. We furnish football now for free through television. Anticipating this roadblock, Murchison had shrewdly purchased the rights to the Redskins fight song, Hail to the Redskins. In exchange for the song's safe return, Marshall begrudgingly changed his vote. The Dallas Cowboys and a new rivalry were born. Marshall gained a small measure of revenge when the teams first met on October 9, 1960. The Redskins won the game 26-14, their only win of the season. Dallas would remain winless. Fierce battles were fought through the 60s, most notably the Sonny Jurgensen led comeback from a 21-0 deficit to a 34-31 victory in 1965. But it wasn't until George Allen's arrival in 1971 that this heated rivalry became an inferno. Allen once offered to fight Tom Landry to determine a game, and the clashing personalities of the two coaches personified the heart of the rivalry. Allen's eccentric blue-collar exuberance, Landry's aloof, stoic, white-collar demeanor. Cowboys had become the team to beat in the East. To Allen, that made them enemy number one and the main focus of his obsessive attention. I found out that they spent uh, close to $3,000 on posties and Christmas cards. We used that money to buy projectors, more projectors to study the Dallas Cowboys. Now we bring those damn Cowboys next. <laughs> on New Year's Eve 1972, those studies paid off as the ravenous Redskins, backed by a frenzied crowd, obliterated the defending champions to claim their first Super Bowl berth. When we beat Dallas here to win the NFC Championship, that was the highlight, I guess, of most of our, some of our careers. We felt like we were the best team in football. For both sides now, fan and player alike, the rivalry had become personal. Over the next decade, it intensified, both teams tasting glorious victories and heartbreaking defeats. In 1982, the Cowboys earned the chance to avenge their NFC Championship loss a decade earlier. They now faced the Joe Gibbs-led Redskins, but history would repeat itself, and a new war cry would become part of the rivalry forever. That game was probably the game uh, for me if I picked one game, it was that game. For all the emotions, we'd never beat them since I'd been here. I really had a dislike for the Cowboys because they felt like they were the, the America's team. They were sort of arrogant. But it was a new day and a new generation that we took over. To be able to share that moment with the people of Washington, with your home fans, at your house, against your arch rival, is the best. Cowboys lead the overall series, but the Redskins, who hold a 2-0 postseason record against Dallas, have enjoyed their share of boastworthy moments, including a memorable season sweep in 2012. On Thanksgiving Day, rookie quarterback Robert Griffin III etched his name into the rivalry's lore with a jaw-dropping performance, 
Powered by Griffin's arm, the Redskins racked up a 28-point second quarter, securing their first Thanksgiving victory in the series history. Just a month later, the teams met again for the type of all-or-nothing brawl that George Allen's dreams were made of. Winner takes the East, loser stays home. It was a back-and-forth slugfest until the fourth quarter, when it became clear the Cowboys star was fading and a Redskins star was rising, rookie running back Alfred Morris. Morris punished the Cowboys, torching the defense for more than 200 yards. Thoughts of a Cowboy comeback were stifled by linebacker Rob Jackson, whose pick of Tony Romo helped the Redskins put the game out of reach, claiming their first division crown since 1999. It began over a song, but now, more than 50 years later, the Redskins-Cowboys rivalry has become part of the very fabric of both teams' traditions. There may never be any love lost between these two franchises or their fans, but football enthusiasts everywhere love a good rivalry, and that's just what it is. Another chapter to be written on Sunday, the Redskins and Cowboys renew the rivalry. Each week here on Redskins Chronicles, we take an in-depth look at a piece of this team's history through the eyes of the men who played the game. And today, Amanda Mitchell and Redskins historian Mike Richmond sit down with the one and only dancing bear, Ron McDole. That's coming up in a moment. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by Diageo. It reminds all Redskins fans, responsibility is the team sport. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by AAA. Welcome back to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Amanda Mitchell, joined by Redskins historian Mike Richmond and the one and only Ron McDole, the dancing bear of the Washington Redskins. Ron, welcome. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. How are you? I'm fine. Now, speaking of the dancing bear, that's kind of a nickname that you can't get away from. I want to hear the story about where that came to be. <laughs> well, you'd have to go to a lot of bars. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually, that was really tagged on me by uh, uh, Sonny Jurgis. Mm -hmm. On a team, a lot of time, guys get nicknames. Mine was uh, happened to be at the Paul Mall in Georgetown, <laughs> Paul Lucas and stuff. Well, uh, and. It was a kind of a contest to dance on who could stay on the table the longest or whatnot. And, and there was a couple of, uh, I think, uh, Summer on and uh, Brooke Shar was doing broadcasting then. And, and uh, they were there, and uh, Sonny started calling me the dancing bear. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and they carried it up in the booth, and everybody, you know, thought it looked like a bear anyway. <laughs> and uh, so what kind of happened was, is it, uh, they started calling me that, and uh, so everybody thought that that's what it was, but it was from dancing in the bars. <laughs> so that was your adult nickname. As a yeah. child, you were raised in Toledo, Ohio. Right. And did you have any nicknames growing up? Uh, not really. Uh, no, I didn't, have, I didn't have a nickname. No nicknames, but how did you get started playing football? Really, I was a baseball player, and when I was in junior high, uh, and I enjoyed playing baseball. And then we, they, uh, in Ohio, Toledo, Ohio was a big uh, football s state. They had um, uh, a junior high team that was coached by the fathers, type of thing. And uh, and uh, so I got kind of I was I was big, not real big, but uh, I was uh, kind of got rocked into playing because I was bigger and. Uh, they needed linemen. <laughs> now, was and your father one of the coaches? No, no, no. no. And uh, uh, I just started playing. We had a, a, a organized, in Ohio, very organized. There was eight schools and stuff like that. And we'd play at their stadium on a Saturday night. Of course, that, they would scout us to see who they were looking for to get guys and invite them to come and play when we got in high school. And that's kind of how uh, I got involved in it. Now, you played your college football at, uh, at Nebraska. How did you end up going there? Well, uh, we, were, we, had a, we had good teams in Ohio, and, uh, and, and we were city champs, I don't know how many times, but there was, uh, Nebraska started, was recruiting. Uh, they were dominated, they were in the Big Eight, and they were dominated by, at that time it was the Big Eight, they were dominated by Oklahoma and Bud Wilkinson and all that stuff. And, so the Nebraska people, as I've found over the years, they, they don't like losing. So they, they started putting programs together to bring players and a lot of uh, scholarships. I think the first year I was, when I was a freshman, there was 125 of us on scholarship. 
Uh, now I don't I think you can't even have anything close to that. And they even put together a, um, a, a scholastic deal where they people contributed money so it didn't count against the athletic program. And uh, that's why they usually have a lot of these kids are straight-A students now that play for them. And that's because they're on athletic, uh, just scholastic scholarships. Of course, right. uh, so they can get more people. Now you played on both sides of the ball at Nebraska, weren't you? A uh, yeah, we uh, played. We we yeah. Back then, we had to play both ways. So, uh, but I was I changed so much in difference. So that's kind of how you end up in funny places. But uh, that's why I end up. I never played for the baseball team. But you I made had a great baseball college team. career, <laughs> and then you were drafted by the NFL in 1961 right. by the Cardinals. The draft was a little different back in those days. Talk to me about that experience. Oh, it was a lot different then. Well, see, we were the second draft of the AFL at that time, so they would all try. To, they didn't want to uh, draft you. They drove you crazy all the time. You know, like we were being in all, we were at all star games. I was down in the blue gray game and the senior bowl and that type of thing. And our draft, uh, the AFL drafted first, and of course I was drafted by Denver. And then the Canada uh, was also a draft there. I was drafted by Winnipeg. And so the NFL kept holding off. They were going to draft last because they didn't want to sign somebody that was committed and this type of thing. So you were being babysat and moved around. And once you, your, your, your career was kind of over in college, uh, they would try to, they'd call you up, they'd send you this. And, and I had like, I thought for sure I was going to be drafted by the 49ers to play offensive guard, which I really didn't want to play offensive <laughs> guard, but you, did, you just wanted to play. Uh, and uh, since we played both ways, uh, it didn't make it, you know, def defense or offense. And then what happened is, is that uh, uh, Denver and Green Bay and Minnesota and so on. So, so I was went through a lot of different teams when you first got drafted into the NFL. We definitely want to hear a little bit more about that and then most importantly your time as a Redskin. But we'll hear more from Ron McDowell when Redskins Chronicles returns. And we're back. It's Redskins Chronicles with former Redskins great Ron McDowell. Ron, we heard a little bit about you being drafted into the NFL. Talk to us about those first few years. We know that you had a rough first few years with some migraine headaches. It's causing you some problems on the field. Let's hear about that. Well, uh, yes, uh, it wasn't, uh, I was drafted by the uh, Cardinals, of course, and uh, made their ball club, uh, didn't have any trouble there. They'd fired their coach, Pop Ivy, and, and hired Wally Lim from Houston Oilers, so they actually just swept jo switched jobs. And so uh, when I came back the second year to the Cardinals, uh, I had a new coach, of course, and basically, I left there at the end of the season. That certainly didn't stop you. Right. In uh, 1963, you signed with the Bills of the American Football League. So you yeah, I went through Minnesota. A lot of people don't know I went through Minnesota. But I went through Minnesota all the way to Buffalo. But I, I enjoyed it. Buffalo is a great place. Still is a great place to play. The people are fantastic. You get, the only trouble is, if you go shopping, be prepared to get chewed out. <laughs> so how did George Allen get you from the Bills? You, know, huh? you were having a good season with the Bills. How right. did George Allen get you? He bothered Buffalo to death to get me. I mean, really what it amounted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Ralph Wilson, who owns them, is a great guy. And Ralph Wilson said, uh, he, uh, he said, George bothered me so much, he called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. He, of course, he lived in Detroit and really wasn't there with the team so much. And he said, he drove me nuts so much. He said, <laughs> then he said, we were going down to Skids. He said, we had a whole building and a whole team. And he said, I just felt that uh, all the good years that you gave me and everything else was, the least I could do is send you somewhere that, uh, you know, you could play. And that's really what he did. And uh, Now that was 1971, George right, Allen's 1971. first season in D.C. And right. I, I, I've heard the story, Allen traded three draft picks to the Bills for you, but didn't he trade those same three picks? Well, I to traded team? a couple of them to somebody else for Ricky Pettibone, <laughs> but that's besides George did a lot of things like that. And you were a captain of the Redskins team with Pat Fisher and a few other guys. That was not the first you'd seen of Pat Fisher. 
Oh, you no, saw gosh. him back in Nebraska, isn't that right? Yeah, we were, we've been together forever, really, except for those uh, three or four years I was in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were captains. Actually, he's my godfather. Is he uh, really? Yes, yes. You don't think that's a pain in it? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's very active in the Alumni Association as well. Yes, so we see a, him out yes, and about yes, at the Redskins building. He's a character, yes, so he must right, be quite yeah. a godfather. <laughs> yeah, well, the one advantage is he doesn't bother me that much because I know everything about him. So if he starts bothering me, I always threaten him, take him back to the home or tell him everything I know about him. <laughs> now, we have the Cowboys this week, and, and you two played in a lot of great Cowboys games. Yes, that was when did. the rivalry was really uh, very intense. Tell us about right. that. All of a sudden, we all hated uh, Cowboys, but we didn't know why. <laughs> George was an um, amazing person to build uh, uh, like the Giants. We hated the Giants, too, but we didn't know why. And because, uh, you know, I really, I didn't hardly know any of the Cowboy players who I'd never played against. Uh, uh, just the ones I knew came out of college the same time I did. The rest of them, I, I never played against some of these teams because I'd been in the AFL for eight years. And um, so it was quite a, try, quite a treat. I mean, we'd have, you know, papers all over the walls and articles. And we weren't allowed to say anything, you know, because they'd put it up like we did. But... It was quite a, it was really quite a rivalry. So what was your favorite year as a Washington Redskin? Oh, well, of course you'd say going to the Super Bowl mm -hmm. would be the great one, but uh, the bad thing about that is if you go, you better win because it's a <laughs> long year. And Ron, we have some highlights from that 1972 oh, yeah. <laughs> year. Let's take a look at the clips. Just remember this, 40 men together can't lose, okay? <laughs> In the early minutes of the championship game, the Cowboys seemed to be the better team. But a football game is played on two levels. One visible, the other in the dirt. Where each move is as vital as a heartbeat and just as invisible. In the man-to-man -man combat on the scrimmage line, the Cowboys surrender the initiative. The Dallas offense collapses and quarterback Roger Starback is no longer a factor. The Redskins' offensive line shuts off the cowboy rush, and Bill Kilmer throws two touchdown passes to Charlie Taylor. With the score 17-3, the Dallas Cowboys suddenly become a middle-aged team, somehow past the point of eagerness and energy that made them champions the year before. Final gun on New Year's Eve, the Washington Redskins run off the field with George Herbert Allen on their shoulders. Well, it's always nice to see the Redskins nab an NFC title from those dreaded Cowboys, isn't it, Ron? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, last little bit of advice from a great lineman. Anything you have to tell young linemen that are trying to get in the NFL? I think the big thing is, is that just to have the confidence you can do and, and uh, you know, do everything you can do to physically to do it and get in shape. I thought the biggest thing that ever helped me was uh, I was a, I was a handball player and mm -hmm. I did that in Nebraska and ragball and that turned out to be the best thing I probably ever did because you have to go left, right, forward, back with all that kind of, and that's what I played defensive line but both positions. Mm -hmm. So perseverance but, and hand-eye coordination. Right, exactly right. Don't give up. Don't give up. Thanks so Don't much, Ron, for up. joining us. All right. We'll take a look at what the Redskins are up to this week when Redskins Chronicles return. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by Diageo. It reminds all Redskins fans, responsibility is the team sport. Redskins Chronicles is brought to you by AAA. Welcome back to Redskins Chronicles. I'm Larry Michael. The Skins back on the field on Sunday. Sunday night football, in fact, in Dallas. Redskins coming off a bye. They had a chance to heal, rest up a bit. And they've got two players returning from suspension, linebacker Rob Jackson and defensive lineman Jarvis Jenkins. Now, for the Cowboys, 
They lit up the scoreboard last week, but 48 points, not enough. Peyton Manning continued the hot hand, and Denver beat the Cowboys on a last-second field goal, 51-48. Tony Romo was just as hot throwing for 506 yards, the most ever in a game by a Dallas QB. The effort included five touchdown passes by Romo, two going to Des Bryant. His performance, however, was overshadowed by a key interception late in the game, picked off inside the Cowboy 30-yard line, setting up the game winner. Matt Prater kicked a 28-yard field goal as time expired, lifting the Broncos to their fifth straight win. They are 5-0. The Cowboys fell to 2-3, setting up the Sunday showdown with the rested Redskins in Dallas. Thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of Redskins Chronicles. I'm Larry Michael at Redskins Park. We'll see you right here next week.